Welcome today to our Mantras for Peace gathering talk with Dr. Kuri Chaudhari. Welcome, my dear. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to get into it with you today. Um, <laughs> we're going to geek it out. We're totally going to geek it out, yeah. Um, among other things, uh, Kulreet is uh, the author of a really interesting book called Sound Medicine. And uh, what's your tagline? How how the ancient science of sound can help yeah. you heal your body and mind? Something, Something like, like that. that. Yeah, I should yeah. know my own tagline. It's like when people ask me my husband's phone number, I'm like, I don't know. It's in the phone. I know. I wrote it like that. I wrote it down, but I can't read my own handwriting anymore <laughs> because I type too much. So, um, <laughs> but um, and you're a uh, neuroscientist or neurologist. Neurologist and neuroscientist, meaning I, I'm an MD, so I treat patients with neurological conditions. Mm -hmm. And a neuroscientist, meaning I also have done um, clinical studies and, and research in neurological conditions. And Ayurvedic medicine. Yes, well. Ayurvedic yes. medicine. Yes. yes. So I'm, I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by this topic and so thrilled to be able to have a chance to talk to you. Um, where do we start? You tell me. What would you like people to know about you sound know, as medicine? I think... And this is what surprised me because I, I grew up meditating. Um, I had a Bija mantra meditation since the age of nine. And I think for, for those who have been in cultures or have been a part of traditions where they have been gifted with mantras at an early age, or for people who are artistic and musical and they've come to, you know, mantras and sound from that perspective, they don't realize necessarily, and this is not to disparage, you know, those musicians that actually have done um, research into the area, but so many people, including myself, really didn't appreciate that there's an entire science behind sound um, and that the science behind sound is as, as valid as the science behind any of our other healing modalities. And so I think that's really what I'd like to get into is that this is an ancient science. It was a science that was well understood by our wisdom traditions from the past, but it's a science that we're even utilizing even in modern medicine, but we haven't fully, you know, we haven't fully tapped into its, its potential. What is its potential? I think its potential really depends on how open we are to redefining what a human being is. Um, oh, yes! <laughs> are we going to do it? It's do up it. in the air. Yes. Okay, yeah. We, you're, you're speaking my language. Now. I, I'm, I'm all right. I'm, I'm singing to the choir. I'm um, preaching to the choir. <laughs> um, I think so much of the technology of sound and where it can go is going to pivot on the way in which the scientific community um, embraces a broader sense of what the human being is. And there's an entire new field of science um, called the biofield science that's starting to lead that charge of saying, look, our old modern of medicine, it's not that it didn't have a purpose, it, it's not that it didn't have a use, it's just it was really limited. And it helped us to understand ourselves as a physical body, but we know all of these other modalities, all of these other ancient modalities that have been proven to work and they don't fit in that paradigm. And just because they don't fit in that paradigm, we're not willing to further explore the technologies behind them. And so I think as we start to look at ourselves and life in general as a series of fields of energy, which is the basic premise of you know, the human biofield, and is the way that the ancients describe human experience is that we are fields of energy. And as you tap into subtler and subtler fields, you're able to access greater knowledge, but also greater capabilities. 
And as you are using sound from those different fields, you're going to be able to do more and more. So when I say it depends on how we define the human being, if we can embrace this, this deeper understanding of human experience and then understand that as we go deeper into the reality that is us, our capacity to utilize sound changes. So somebody who is you know, able to tap into like, the physical field or the mental field, um, these are some of the, the sheets that are described around you know, the inner consciousness. Um, each, each time that they are going deeper into an avenue of their own consciousness, their ability to use sound is also enhanced from being able to just heal your own body to then being able to heal others, to then being able to connect to some of the kind of, you know, ultimate truths about life. So where does it end? You know, I don't know. I don't think it really ends. I think it just depends on how deep we want to go. Mm. <clears throat> a couple of things come, a lot of things come up for me <laughs> hearing that. Um, maybe a, a simple way to draw a comparison would be to, to, to say, maybe it's the difference between being happy with surviving mm. and moving towards thriving. Absolutely. And the way that the, the language around this new field of science, the human biofield, it's so exciting because it's, it's so, you know, it so embraces our modern understanding of quantum physics. And yet it's so, it, it reverberates with such similar language of, of these ancient scientists. Um, what's, so exciting about the way that they're talking about it is, you know, they're describing a, a new network of energy that connects all of life. And um, Dr. Beverly Rubin, I think, you know, describes it best by saying it's nature's wireless system that we have this field of energy, which quantum What's the doctor's name? Beverly Rubin. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, she's a pioneer in the field of um, the human biofield. Okay. Um, and when she is describing kind of what the human biofield is, she's describing it as, you know, nature's wireless um, system. And just as you were saying, like, when we think of our life before there was wireless communication versus after, you see just this tremendous increase in our potential to connect. I mean, look at what you're doing. You wouldn't have been mm. able to connect with so many people before this. And so as we start to understand that, these technologies that are human made are replicas of an inner technology. And when you mm -hmm. know how to tap into that inner technology in one of the most profound ways, um, at least according to the ancient records to tap into that, that wireless um, communication sister nature's wireless communication is through sound. So as we start to learn this, it really, it, it opens up so many more options for us that the things that we struggled with before are now, they're no longer even issues like basic struggles around safety, basic struggles around money, basic struggles around identity. They're no longer even issues. So if you take all of those away, what happens is you start to unleash all this creative potential. And those are the geniuses, you know, that, that we see in history. Um, but really the people that we call geniuses, they're just able to tap in to that inner consciousness. And so sound medicine is just, it's, it's a deliberate way to do it where every average human being can start to practice something that allows them to break through these basic limitations, as you said, of just survival and going way, 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 way beyond that. Yeah, it makes me think about, you know, all of the research that I've come across about how sound, voice, long exhale, and especially chanting in groups mm -hmm. is a really powerful tool for regulating the nervous system. Absolutely. And Which, of course, it regulates the whole body. Right. If your central nervous system is cool and in social engagement rather than yeah. fight, flight, freeze, or collapse, you're going to be able to access those higher functions of your capabilities um, and not just yours but even of the people around you like you know we yeah. have this concept that I think many people who were into wealth building came across the work that you know talked about I think it was Napoleon Hill um, who talked about the mastermind group well, what is that mastermind like what are we talking about 
when we're talking about a mastermind, it's really the coming together of human intellect or human consciousness at some kind of like a super fluid state. You know, it's, it's beyond just the individual. And those are the moments that I find kind of to be the most delicious in life is, is not just my own personal experiences in meditation, although I deeply, deeply value those, but it's when I can take that field of creativity and, you know, bring it to um, other people, whether it's with a coworker or whether it's with my spouse or, you know, with my son. And we start coming up with new creative ideas about the life we want to be living. And, and you're doing it just for the pure enjoyment of it. Mm. You know, that that mm. is where you really start to understand the the true divinity of life, like how creative we really are. You know, and then it starts to it really starts to help me to understand when I read about these ancient masters, especially the Siddha tradition they seem so like superhuman to me. I mean, they just seem so ridiculously intelligent, so bright. You know, they were poets. They were, um, I call them musicians, antibiologists, musicians, musicians everything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're just like, how could all of that fit into one person? But they had a fully functioning human brain. And so every time I, I get kind of overwhelmed in awe of them, I have to mm -hmm. remind themselves we are both human they learned how to unlock the human brain. And that is our birthright. Like that is who we are born to become. And sound is, at least from my research and from my own experience, it's one of the fastest and most widely accessible pathways, you know, to mm -hmm. cultivating that state. Well, my, my personal experience which is you know not researched rigorously under scientific conditions but um my <laughs> anecdotal experience as well as that of you know all the people i know who dive in especially those who are um really honed into the the technique in terms of accurate enunciation mm -hmm. of the of the mantras so that you're actually activating the specific nerve plexes yes. in the palate which are intended as well as um, the musical abilities of um, matching pitch and tone and using your vocal instrument to its capacity um, once you start kind of honing in on to all of those elements wow there's no there's no question yeah it, it, it happens that the the sparking of that potential happens um, inevitably, consistently, reliably, and in a, a mind blowing sort of way. So yeah, that's exactly I'm so right. I'm so thrilled to hear. I mean, to to just have your voice and your view confirming um, all of this, which you know, per, it's been personally my direct experience, and it's um, <laughs> it's very affirming to hear. Well, and there's one really important part to that, too, which has been now kind of both documented by people who are looking into the electromagnetic field effect of the heart, like the Heart Math Institute. But it's also a key part of what the ancients wrote about is that, yes, there's that aspect of it, the technical aspect of it, which is really important. And that's why, um, you know, there were certain mantras because they were so powerful, they were only given. Um, mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. And then others, of course, were given, you know, to the general public because they did have that precision. But there's another really important part of activating sound, and that's the concept of devotion. Or mm -hmm. you could say unconditional love or compassion, whatever it takes to open this heart center, because that is really the motor for energizing that very technical process. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing one or the other, it's not as powerful as when you do the two together. And for, for me, my journey into this was more as a neurologist, a neuroscientist, more as, you know, somebody who wanted to understand the academics of this to see how can I bring this out as a healing modality? Yeah. I mean, how, how can we make this so this is just commonplace knowledge? But 
I, you know, as I was going through that and as my own practice, you know, not just um, silent meditation, but of chanting grew, I was so shocked because, you know, I was a tone deaf neurologist when I started, which I thought was nature's funniest like, <laughs> joke, was Let, let's have a tone deaf neurologist do this. Why not? Um, but what I was so surprised to find is even though I didn't have the technical aspect of it in the beginning, I developed it. I actually learned yeah. how to sing, um, not on purpose, but it was like the natural result of just being in the practice and that there were aspects of the technical part that unfolded because the devotional part of it for me became, yeah. um, you know, it became a living space like within me. And that, that devotion, and again, I think everybody has a different way of getting to there. I don't think there's a cookie cutter way. And even though I had a very long meditation practice, it was that devotional aspect that was never part of my meditation that just got birthed when I was in India and doing all of this. And it completely transformed everything mm. about my med- I mean, it was just like, I didn't even think I was, it's like, I don't think I was meditating before. That devotional wow. aspect transformed my voice when I was chanting and it started having qualities, um, you know, I still wouldn't necessarily like go and sing on stage, but it started having qualities that musicians were able to recognize as purposeful yeah. sound rather than what, what it was before. Oh my God, that's adorable. <laughs> oh, would, you, would you be willing to, to talk about that moment? It, for you like what what happened yeah I, I don't think it was necessarily a moment what happened to me was when I went to India and I, I went to India in kind of full bravado and arrogance and ego of um he, here I am India um ah. here I am you know this which is like the best way you could possibly enter India right for anybody oh, who's right. been to India it's yeah. like oh she is gonna get her ass kicked next. <laughs> um, yep. You know, there yep. was this there Not was this the really inflated sense um of, you know, I, I don't think it was it's abnormal to the Western culture, but there was this really inflated sense of I'm gonna go there to do something for somebody. Right. A kind of and savior, savior not, idea, or not something a savior like that. idea, but I think more from a scientific standpoint of mm. like I'm going to somehow go there and discover something important and then yeah. give it to humanity. Um, yeah. You know, like like I was somehow more in charge of the process than I actually was. And yeah. of course, I get there. <laughs> I'm stripped of absolutely every aspect of myself because I'm a woman. I'm a Western woman, but even worse, I'm a Western woman of Indian descent. It doesn't get any worse than that. Like that combination, like you cannot get any lower than that <laughs> in rural India. And I, I, I got so there. Out of place. It's so yeah. out of place. And it's just, it's like, you know, even if I was like not of Indian descent, I would have somehow more clout. But it was like, oh, well, she's just Indian. <laughs> you know? They just and don't know what to make of that, right? No. Yeah. And so one after the other, I just realized like what a complete and utter failure I was because I couldn't accomplish anything with anything that was part of my outer covering. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my role as a physician didn't get me anywhere. My background in Ayurveda didn't get me anywhere. My education didn't get me anywhere. Um, you know, my accomplishments in America didn't get me anywhere. And so it was really this moment of total collapse going, I'm no one here. I'm no one and I'm doing absolutely nothing. And so I think it's when you hit that moment of emptiness where you say, I am impotent. Like I am inanimate here. I mean, I, I, there's nothing to mo- you know to motivate action. <laughs> that you have to reach down deeper and say, well, if I can't do it, and this was a project that I was so dedicated to, and you know was so profoundly devoted to, um, that if I can't do it, being all of these things, then what aspect of me has any say in this land? And from that birth, this new energy, really. And it was not me as a woman, um, which thank God it was genderless because if it had a gender, I would just, you know, be upset at everything that happened on a daily basis. But it was not me as a woman. It was not 
you know, me as an Indian. It was not me as an American. It wasn't me as a doctor. It was something that was without all of that. And even though I recognized it as obviously being part of me because, you know, it was part of my experience, I recognized it as something being so much bigger than anything I had accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I couldn't link it to anything I did in, in, in any of my external activities. And it was in that moment of humility and whatever this energy was, it got stuff done. I mean, it just was always at the right place at the right time. And it just got stuff done. And the only time that things came to a halt was when the identifications came back up. And there was just something about being knocked down to your knees like that, that opened up the space for me of, of, of love, appreciation, gratitude, and wanting to know more of what was this energy that was coming in that seemed to be so full of grace. And it was really for me like the humility opened up the gates for devotion. And Aww. I don't I don't see how that, at least for my personality, I don't see how that could have ever happened without having having failed in such a massive way. <laughs> you know, in such a magnificently massive way. Oh my god. And, and, and trying to get something done that I was, you know so devoted to and totally unable, um, you know, to do that was what turned it around and said, okay, connect to something so much bigger than what you know yourself to be. Wow. Thank you so much for being so, uh, transparent with sharing that story. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. It, it it says it says a lot that you're willing to just kind of lay it all out there like that. It's and already out there. That's the other thing I realized is all all the stuff about ourselves that we hide from ourselves, the world sees anyways. We're the, yeah. we're usually the last ones to see it. So when we embrace it and, and embrace it compassionately, and this was what was so nice about that experience was the devotion that developed, that heart centeredness that developed. It also developed for me, and you know I could look back at all of the aspects of myself that I was holding on to so tightly and with compassion and go, I understand how I got there. But that also gave me the clarity to see how my mantra meditation had been chipping away at that for so long and how mm. years and years and years of meditating had prepared me for this moment, for that, yeah. you know, for the eggshell to finally burst open in the right. heart and be like, come yeah. on, come Here on, we go. come on out, you know, let's drop yeah. all this and, Let's be that thing that connects all of us. And, and for me, that was all through the, you know, decades of practicing mantra meditation. But then it was in the study of sound. I mean, that's the irony of it. It was in the study of sound when I was writing the book and all of the crazy experiences that came with the writing of this book. I've never written a book that had so many crazy experiences attached to it. And it just pulled me out of everything I thought, you know, that I was up to that point. Wow. That's, that's beautiful and inspiring. And, and it makes me remember with a deep, deep fondness that, you know, I think bhakti, the devotion, the, the energy of devotion and the expression of devotion in all in my time in India, it, it, it shines for me as my like the 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 highest cultural value. Yeah. And um, in all, I mean, we can go on about how it. There are so many failings, and you know, like you have a value, and then you don't live up to it in various ways, which is the same in any country or any right. religious order. But um, but the fact that. Um, you know, that that was your awakening and hearing your story just makes me remember that um, for myself and just I, really want to take a bow uh, of gratitude to, to India and Indian culture. I wanted to say one keeping more thing that about, alive, you know, about India, if you don't mind, if I just take Please. this, yeah. what I learned about India and mantra and, and bhakti was it's a, it's a very unusual land. It's not that you can't succeed there using other ways, but it's very hard to succeed there and stay true to yourself and um, untouched by a lot of the corruption 
yeah. um, without bhakti and without mantra. I would say that there's only two things in India that that work: God and money. Like those are the only two things that work in India. <laughs> it's like you're either on the side of just pure money, power, corruption, <laughs> or you have found some way to connect with that cosmic energy that just shines like a flashlight through the maze and you just get through in this absolutely spontaneous way. And that's and very the, insightful. <laughs> and the beauty and the beauty of the Bhakti tradition is it so heavily, heavily embraces the power of mantra, the power of sound. Yeah. Either uh, Bhakti or Bhakshish, one, one or the other, right? Yeah, that's great. I love that. That should be a bumper sticker. I mean, it probably be. already is. <laughs> We're not the first ones to talk about this. That's great. Oh, well. Um, as we're wrapping, I mean, it feels like this could this could be a conversation that we could have regularly. That you know, we would discover new things every time, especially as you continue your work and and your research with all of these things. But um, as we're wrapping up our time today. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of kind of quick questions. Please. And um, so if you could wave a magic wand and normalize one thing that isn't normal today and with this, uh, what would that be? Um, I think it would be that all parents should honor the hearts of children. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, if as a culture, we started just very, very young at honoring the gifts that are already present in children, how heart centered they are, how much they come with unconditional love. If we could just let them stay in that state and honor that and create a space where they only go deeper into that, then I think all of these other discoveries, whether it's with sound, light or anything else, that's just going to happen naturally. It, the hardest journey is just, um, you know, leaving so many of the traumas that happens to pretty much everybody nowadays, leaving those traumas and learning how to open your heart. I think most adults spend most of their life just trying to accomplish that. So could you imagine if we had an entire society where children were never taught to close down? Mm. So, and from that place, that's how then they approach, you know, approach the world. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. And, Last question, if you, again, could wave a magic wand and empower everyone with one tool, what would that oh, tool be? so easy. Mantra. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy. I, I, I can't remember what the circumstances were. Somebody asked me, like, if you had to give everything up, what's the one thing you would hold on to? And I would be, it would be the knowledge of, of mantra. The knowledge of my spirit. To me, those are inseparable. The knowledge of my spiritual teacher, my, my spiritual guru in India, and, and mantras, that those two things are the same to me because it was through that tradition that I went deeper into understanding mantra. But mm -hmm. I would not give up the knowledge of mantra, which may sound odd because you might say, well, it would I wouldn't give up my husband or my son or whatever. But that knowledge helped me to see who they really were. Like without mm. that, I didn't have the lenses to really see the beauty of their infinity, you know. Mm. Otherwise, they were just these small people that I had this little life with. But it was through the experience of mantras, it just opened my eyes to kind of just the infiniteness of each person in my life and just how grateful I was that they chose to spend this little bit of time with me. <laughs> Wow, I love the way you articulate that. And um, and I, I think I'm right there with you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> same. Hence, this project and everything we <laughs> <you> do. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, my dear. Just brilliant, beautiful in all the ways. Thank you for having me. And thank you for doing this work. <sighs> it's so... It's truly a pleasure and an honor. And um, yeah, and I, I hope, even if it touches one person, I'm happy. That's enough. Yeah. You can bring the understanding of this to one person. That's enough. That's a life, you know, that's a life well lived, honestly. To do anything to have helped even one person on that deep of a level, that's, you know, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all the best for, for your work. And so 
Thank you so much, dear. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,